our guest today, I'm excited about this one because uh, uh, Ian's a friend of mine and, and he has uh, grown uh, a reputation in our industry for really having some uh, impressive information when it comes to practice and learning and transference to the course. Uh, so Ian Highfield, welcome, buddy. It's good to see you. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. I'm, uh, uh, I'm excited. Yeah, well, me too, man. Uh, Ian, just for those on here who don't know you, give us just um, a, a little bit of background on you. And also, because I, I can't keep up with you half the time anyway, where you are now. I know you're up in Boston. Yeah. So yeah. give us a give us a, a, a rundown. I'll, I'll, I'll try and be quick. It, it's changed a lot recently. So um, high school, rugby, football, cricket and golfer. So multi-sport athlete when I was in high school. I went to college on a rugby scholarship, but also now and again made the odd appearance for the for the golf team. Um, I graduated, and upon graduating, I didn't play any sports. Uh, I'd quit rugby. Um, I really wasn't playing golf at a high level. Uh, I was kind of burnt out and, and stressed, and I wanted to understand why someone so good, so young, could be so average or get so average so quickly. So I really did take a deep dive into um, sports psychology. I took a deep dive into um, how people learn. That led me to motor learning literature, uh, so on and, and so forth. Um, I started a small junior golf program in England where we really only um, supported swing coaches by helping their players uh, think differently on the golf course. So sports psychology practice a little differently. Um, it was kind of a side hustle at first while I was figuring out what I wanted to do. Uh, and then before I knew it, I was talking to England schools golf. I was working with European tour players. Uh, and then it, I really sort of discovered my dream job when I got recruited to be the director of mental performance um, at a couple of junior golf academies in Florida, um, where I really sort of put my, my theories to the test. Um, more recently, uh, I started a company called Game Like Training, um, where we talked about the benefits of gamifying practice and uh, gamifying golf's mental game. Uh, and then I was approached by a company called Core Golf. Um, they are an amazing institution just outside of Boston. Uh, they have a, an unbelievable practice facility with... Um, when I joined about 90 juniors uh, and they asked me to be the director of their um, golf academy. So I'm currently the director uh, of Core Golf and I do some consulting for uh, David Ledbetter Golf Academies. Um, I lecture for Penn State University, work with a couple of professional players designing practice programs, uh, PGA of China and, and some other things. But I think ultimately, my philosophy is based on the mistakes that maybe I made as a, as a child and trying to understand and, and rectify some of my own uh, failings. So hopefully some of the information I, I can give you today um, will help the junior golfers or the club golfers that perhaps get frustrated that they work so hard uh, and swing changes never seem to stick or their range game doesn't transfer to the golf course, as, as they would put it. And that's it, I think. I think that might be the fastest I've done it. So <laughs> That was good, man. Uh, and, and on top of that, um, because we certainly want to give you a plug for this too, is but I uh, outlined to everybody the books that you've written because I, I, have, all, I have all of them, um, and they're, yeah. they're super helpful. So the first one I wrote is called Osvia. Um, Practical Ways to Learn Golf's Mental Game. So OSVIR is an acronym for Options, Selection, Visualization, Execution, and Acceptance. Uh, and it, it really sort of gives you games and drills and, and makes the, makes the pre-shot routine training, it makes the mental game training very practical. Um, I wrote it, when I wrote it, I didn't really know how to write a book or what I was doing. So the front cover's not that great. The title's not very good. It's not really directed towards any specific audience. Uh, but if you can see through all that, uh, some of the information is, is very good. Uh, and then the second book uh, that I wrote is called Golf Practice, How to Practice Golf and Take Your Range Game 
uh, to the golf course. This was when I was at Game Like Training, and I wrote this with some incredible coaches, Matthew Cook, Eric Zeigel, and, and Zach Parker, who were all part of the, the Game Like Training tribe. And ultimately, the, the, the science of human learning and the science of human performance is very uh, unattainable. It's written in journals. It's stuck in universities. It's hard for a lot of people to get hold of. So I, I spent a few years going to some great institutions, speaking to people like Dr. Tim Lee, who's a motor learning expert, Dr. Anders Ericsson. Unfortunately, he's no longer with us, um, but is an expert in human performance. And really, I started to figure out what golfers were doing wrong and why swing changes weren't sticking and why the range game wasn't transferring it to the golf course. So I tried to make that information really practical, really digestible. That's written for players, but there's definite value in there for coaches. Uh, and it's definitely a slight evolution from the, from the first book. I'm, I'm pretty proud of the, the second one. Um, and yeah, the third one is called Creating Positive Change. So the, the mental performance program that I do in the classroom, it's always backed up with stories um, from maybe the NFL, from people like Inky Johnson, from people like Eric Thomas. And I, I take sort of some key psychological habits of excellence and I really just make it a little bit more entertaining for a, a, a teenager or a 20 year old or a 30 year old that, you know, maybe they do want to focus on um, happiness, but don't really know how to go about it. So then there's some cool stories with YouTube videos and things like that, that, that might help them get connected to, to, to sort of psychological habits of excellence and, and evolving themselves as a person, not just always thinking about the, the golf swing and their golf score. Cool. So uh, I tell you what, let's, Ian, let's, uh, let's get it rolling again. So to everyone, um, please just keep mics muted, but please type questions in the chat. Uh, I'll fire them off. We'll let Ian give us a uh, drop some knowledge on us here and let's get rolling. Go for it, man. Perfect. So I, I really do uh, try and make the, the academia very understandable and applicable. And I think for most people on this call, being similar age to, to me, uh, the Top Gun movie is a, is a great place to start. Uh, so when we're looking at what the, the scientists would call retention and transfer of skill, or the golfer would say, I'm practicing and nothing is changing, I'm not getting any better. I hit it so good on the range, but I don't hit it good in practice. Why is that? Often we, we struggle to um, articulate a succinct answer. I know I did when I first started coaching. And, and I myself, I used to see players, I'd be teaching them um, certain aspects of golf's mental game uh, and they could articulate it well, they could apply it. And then we would go and we'd play a few holes. Um, so they were applying it on the range and they would apply it on the golf course. And then I would watch them in tournament play and those behaviors would that, that I desired from them or that they desired to, to be in a better state, to, to be able to make the golf club move more effectively, um, they deserted them. Uh, so I wanted to figure out why. Uh, and this video really helps us understand why. So I'm gonna press play. I really want you to pay close attention to the words that are, that are being said and, and what's going on uh, around this awesome film. Gentlemen, this is your first talk. The jets you are flying against are smaller, faster, and more maneuverable, just like the enemy makes. The clock is ticking, and as of now, we are keeping score. I still got him. He's still back there. Come on, man. Just about that pilot shit. Yeah, I got him. So 
it's cool to watch it on the film, but I initially read that. Uh, I initially read about the Top Gun school in Dr. Anders Ericsson's book, Peak. So if you want to learn about human performance and you want to understand like how people learn and how people become great, Peak by Dr. Anders Ericsson is a, is a phenomenal book. And he pointed out that during the Vietnamese war, the US and the enemy fighter planes were being shot down at a ratio of one to one. So what the US did in response to this awful statistic was they launched the Top Gun school that you've just seen. Now, right at the start of that video, gentlemen, you will be scored for your performance. The planes we're flying against represent enemy minks. They're faster, they're more maneuverable than the planes you will be flying. The clock starts ticking, go. So what the US did was they realized the way they were training their pilots, it lacked context. Um, simulators or keeping them safe. Uh, you know, there was a bit of uproar about the Top Gun school at first because pilots could die in training and they didn't want that. But then they realized that the recreation and simulation of the specific conditions that they were going to face in battle helped teach them quick, critical thinking and reactions when they were actually in training, ready for battle. So we just saw there, um, Maverick, I'll hit the brakes and fly right by. I'll hit the brakes and fly right by. Basically, in a situation where he could, if something goes wrong, potentially die. So now I'm going to press play here. Uh, and let's look at what happens in the real thing. Let's look for the transfer of skill. Hey, move. There's a big undertale. There's a big undertale. We've got a problem here. We've only got one missile left. Approaching 110 miles, sir. God damn it. I got him. I got him. He's right on us. He's on our tails. <laughs> So we can see there, I hit the brakes, you'll fly right by in practice. I hit the brakes, you'll fly right by in the real thing. Um, without the practice, without the practice recreating and simulating specific conditions, would Maverick have ever been able to do that in battle? Um, and just so you know, after the launch of Top Gun, after the school was launched, the statistics changed dramatically. It went from one to one planes being shot down to one to 12 in favor of the U S. So there was a direct correlation between that statistic and the way they trained the pilots, um, far more articulately explained by Dr. Erickson in his book with stats and things like that. Me, I just thought the top, I can remember watching Top Gun as a kid. And I was like, I'm going to watch the film back and see if Dr. Erickson's stuff is in there. And, and it is, it's there for us all to see. So, I think that's a cool way to sort of open up the, the presentation uh, and allow you guys to see what we're going to try and cover today. So I think the biggest key is that change is an environmental change. So often when we're talking about performance, we're, we're asking players, what are they thinking? What are they doing? Where's their focus? But Ultimately, a lot of academic research will ask not what's in the player's head, but what their head is in. So think about this from an environmental standpoint. The picture on the left, what is the player's head in? It's very reductionistic. It's very safe. It's very nicely designed. It's very clean. There's hardly any variability hitting the same club to the same target over and over again. There's very little challenge. There's not much space between each shot. So this environment here, the golf range environment, it is absolutely not 
a mecca of learning. No learning scientist will tell you that the golf range is a great place to learn golf because often it lacks spacing, it lacks variability, and it lacks challenge. And we'll go into those um, a little bit later. I think the golf range is so popular because in 2022, one of the things that we really struggle for is time. So people like to go to the golf range because of time constraints. And then when they're on the golf range, they can hit balls, it's very therapeutic, and they can get this feeling of what they want golf to be like. Unfortunately, because of the lack of context on the golf range, because of the lack of variability, because of the lack of challenge, those skills don't transfer. It's two different environments. So when someone says, I can't get my swing change to stick, or when someone says, I hit it so good on the range, but not on the golf course, it's purely because of the environment that the golf range provides. So what I worked on with Matthew Cork, Zach Park, Eric Zeigel, and, and a lot of these learning scientists was trying to do this, trying to close the gap between the range and the golf course, because there is a place for the range. Not everyone can go out on the golf course. There's regulations that don't allow you to practice on the golf course. So how can we evolve what we do on the range to actually increase the chances of swing changes sticking and increase the chances of uh, those swing changes and higher performance making its way to the golf course? So ultimately, how do we learn skills? So this is what Dr. Tim Lee and a, a few of the other motor learning experts, Dr. Richard Smith, uh, taught me. There's th really three key components to learning something. The spacing effect, the variability effect, and the challenge point. So the spacing effect in golf practice would be the time between each shot. So unfortunately, in golf, the time between each shot on the range is very little. So what tends to happen is players get hold of a feeling and keep it. That's not learning. Learning is actually losing the feeling and being able to recall it. So there's no such thing as muscle memory. When, when a golfer comes in and says, I've hit a thousand balls and I was grooving my golf swing, probably about ball number six or ball number seven, they lost engagement and they just were keeping hold of a feeling. And they were just repeating a feeling, but there was no cognitive engagement, so they weren't learning. So super simple one for any club golfer, any golfer, if they go to the range and they're going to hit 20 balls, make those balls last 20 minutes because they'll hit ball number one, then they'll have to wait, then they'll probably plan the shot a bit better, they'll probably reflect a little bit better on the previous shot. And then as they get to the ball, they'll be like, what did I do 45, 50 seconds ago? Let me think about that. And they've kind of lost that feeling, and then they have to challenge themselves to recall it. So 20 balls in 20 minutes would help the spacing effect. Now, Variability. So again, often golfers on the range, same club, same target, or sometimes not even, not even target, just same club, just trying to find that push draw, get it, and then just keep it, keep it and never let it go. Um, so what we can do is, if we were doing 20 balls in 20 minutes, we might do the first five in five minutes, and then, you have to hit a pitch shot onto a green inside a certain proximity, or you have to go and hold an eight foot pot. And then you come back and you get your next five balls in five minutes. We've added a little bit of variability to the task. And more so now, you do those first five balls, and on ball five, you're like, yeah, there it is, that push draw seven iron that I dream of. Now you've got to go hit a pitch shot. Now you've got to go hold a pot, whatever it is that the coach chooses to do. When you come back and you're on ball number one again, you're like, right, I have to engage my work in memory. I have to recall what happened not just one minute ago, 
but maybe three minutes ago and a different task has been put in between. So again, the brain works hard. And what that does is it fires the synapses in the brain. That cognitive engagement or cognitive stress, as it's sometimes called, the thinking element creates the wires in your brain to fire and wire together. That's synaptogenesis. And that's how we learn. Now, if you're just on ball 27, 28, 29, no synaptogenesis taking place, just general blood flow and just nice physical movements on a, on a repetition. Um, and then challenge. So there's two ways to look at challenge. If we did 20 balls in 20 minutes and we did a pitch shot in between every five balls, maybe you could award a certain amount of points for how good the pitches are. Maybe you could award a certain amount of points for center face contact um, with the iron shot. You know, self measures and, and scoring, that can, be, that can be anything, but that can create a certain level of challenge because towards the end of the practice, you might be going for your best score. So then there's a bit of outcome focus. There's something you've got to deal with, um, can create motivation. But I think the key to challenge, that to manipulate and the challenge point appropriately is the more space and the more variability you put into your practice, the higher the challenge point is likely to be. Um, and we'll, we'll go into that. But you think yeah. of golf? Yes. So, so real quick, and just to remind everybody, please make sure you put questions in the chat. If you, if you took these three, uh, these three ideas and you looked at people on the range, is there one you think golfers are particularly bad at more than the other, or is it the combination of, of multiple? Uh, I, I, I'm, I don't know if this is going to answer your question. I, I did ask Dr. Lee what's the most important. And I think he said spacing. Hmm. Well, I don't think I know he said spacing. And think about the range. It is just like a machine gun of golf balls just going out, especially the juniors. So at, at core goal, our juniors are banned from buckets. They are not allowed buckets. Because what happens is they put the buckets right next to where they hit, they tip over and they go rake hit. We have one huge uh, bin of, of golf balls and our juniors are only allowed to go and get five at a time. And that's it. That's how we create the space and effect because you're never going to beat the environment, Mark. Like, you know, I, I exercise. Sometimes I loosen the reins and I eat too much ice cream over Christmas. If there's ice cream in my fridge, I am losing that battle. So I know if there's ice cream in my fridge, I'm not serious about, about losing weight. I'm going to go there and I'm going to eat it. I know if my students get golf balls and tip them out next to the mat, then they're just going to lose that battle, just like I am with the ice cream. At first, we let them have baskets and we said they had to be uh, seven feet behind the hitting area. And they were allowed to go and get one ball at a time, but it didn't work. They didn't have the discipline to, to do it. So we, we took it to the next level. So I would say golfers do all of these three things very poorly, but I would say probably the spacing effect is done the poorest, probably or the least understood. I do think golfers know they should change targets. And, and, and I do think golfers know that playing games and scoring things is, is good. You see them doing that on the range but everything is too fast. Um, so I would definitely say, I think the space in effect would be the number one to focus on there. No, that's good. And, and I, I, and I've learned a couple of these concepts from you before and the spacing one is one I've used with my students and, and it really makes a big difference. Um, we got a couple of questions I want to throw at you before you slide on, man. So, uh, yep. Richard's got one for you. Can you speak on finding the proper challenge level? This is a good one versus building the player's confidence. Yeah, so that's a great question, and you've almost you've almost answered the question very well your, yourself. Because if we say, okay, we're going to play a game, and it's out of ten, 
and a student scores one, probably not beneficial for their confidence. If we say we're going to play a game and the student scores 10 out of 10 every single time, um, then that's a problem because motivation is low and they just end up going through the motions. So I have read something that says the learning sweet spot is like seven, six to seven. Um, for me, I don't know if I believe that. Uh, I think if I've got a good... So, so I, I have a couple of players who've had some real big successes, like real big successes recently. I might give them a game where they're going to score one out of 10 on purpose to bring them back down with a, with a bump. Um, and then, you know, I, I don't necessarily coach the really small kids, but if you're new to the game and it's fun getting points, I think that they should be getting like hundreds of millions of points and they should be involved in actually designing the scoring system with the coach. So, you know, if I have a real young kid or sometimes I help out our training camp, I'll be like, how many points do you want for this shot? And they'll be like, oh, 100 million. I'll be like, you know what? It's worth 200 million. Let's go. And you're just using it as a motivational thing. So I, I think it's actually, I don't think it's dependent on confidence. I think it's dependent on where that golfer is in their journey or in their in their journey in the sport. And then in that moment, what are we working towards? Are we working towards the U S open where we know it's going to be brutal or have you just come off the back of some really poor runs and we need to look at your stats and we need to make the baseline score like something very attainable to help you get some confidence back. So I think it's just down to the individual, um, but that is a good question because it's very relevant and I'll do, I'll do stuff at core golf and I've done stuff with, tour players and college teams and I have absolutely messed up the challenge point but I'm not afraid to step in halfway through the game and say guys this scoring system's wrong or there's too much space between here let's change this this and this and then there's other times where I've designed games and I've gone home and my wife's been like how's your day and I'm like it was amazing I got the challenge point like perfect and she's like I have no idea what you're what you're talking about um so I think as a coach, you just can't be scared to change a game halfway through if you see it's not working. Uh, we got two more on here, Ian, so we'll hit these. Uh, Linda's asking, uh, I feel like maybe you've done something like this before, but uh, maybe it wasn't you, but could the variability be, uh, maybe you're doing this with juniors, for instance, to do something like an exercise such as push-ups, jumping jacks, or sprints? Yeah, so we do at, at core. I think that's one of the best ways because I, I think, if you come to core golf now and you start to ask some of the more growth minded students about their golf swing, they're going to say they're not too concerned with it because the way that they're shaping their body is going to start to help them move the club in a more effective way. And what we, what we have is we have five balls, hit five balls, and then it's, okay, what is it? Is it your abs? that Do you need to do your dead bugs? Do you need to do your reverse lunges? Which TPI exercises are we, are we working on? Is it are we targeting the pelvis? And they will do those. Um, and then they'll go and get their five balls. And this is all written down. And, and we make our kids do what's called PAR, plan, act, reflect. So in PAR, it would probably say five balls focused on left wrist. Then it would say four minutes of TPI exercise ABC. And then they come back round. So I don't, I don't always like the ones where if you fail a task, you have to do 10 push-ups or you have to run sprints. I feel like kids enjoy that. I don't necessarily think that that's the, the way to go. But I think if the physical conditioning stuff you're doing is in line with going to help them uh, change their body and swing the club more easy, I think that's a perfect way, probably the best way to to uh, use variability yes cool uh one more on here ian and and this is a this is a good one uh because you know there's also the theory you talk about the variability and the spacing but there's also the idea like hogan said you're digging it out of the dirt so uh larry ringer who's one of our hall of famers and led the u.s senior open after round one in 95 i think i get that right mr ringer uh is asking um ian do you believe that 
the repetitious actions lead to subconscious reactions. If you agree, then do you not believe that numerous shots on the range help that process? I, so I, you know, it's, it's hard to, to answer these questions when you've seen Ben Hogan say, dig it out the dirt. In other sports, you've seen the Williams sisters engage in block practice. Uh, the Tiger hit tons of balls. Something got clipped of me recently about Alex Noren, and it was like a five minute conversation, but I focused, they focused on like 10 seconds and it made me sound like not, not that cool towards Alex Noren. So I want to be careful how I, how I say this because I don't want to seem, you know, I'm a guy sat in his basement talking about practice. These guys have won millions of dollars and majors and stuff. So I don't want to seem like I'm saying what they're doing is wrong. So I think that those people are potentially superhuman. And I believe that when they're engaging in block practice, their level of motivation is so high that they managed to keep engaged and they managed to um, change patterns and, and transfer skills because of some level of motivation or engagement or genius that, that they had that the majorities don't. And I don't believe that we should be building training programs for young kids around the fact that Ben Hogan hit hundreds of thousands of balls or Nicholas says, dig it out the dirt because burnout is a real thing. Kids drop out of sport. Injuries are a real thing. And, and the science of learning and, and human performance is telling us that the golf range lacks context and that the golf range lacks um, the, the, the environmental factors needed for us to become better golfers on the golf course. So there's not, it's not that there's no place for it and it's not, I would never critique an elite player. I just think like as technology evolves, everything is evolving around us. And I think our understanding of the human brain and body is evolving. Uh, and I just, on the whole, I don't think you need to spend hours and hours and hours hitting balls on the range. I think there's far more beneficial ways to practice, protect yourself against injury, protect yourself against burnout, um, and, and be a more uh, well, well-formed person or human. Cool. You can keep sliding on, man. I'll throw any more okay. questions as they come. Perfect. So, again, so I think, you know, in all of those questions are going to be linked to, to these couple of slides. So let's say you have a beginner and, and now we're on the golf range and we want to implement spacing, variability and challenge. We, you guys buy into this concept and you're like, you know what, maybe Ian is right. Let's, let's try this. So you have your, you have your standard person that wants to break hundred or wants to break 90 and they come for a lesson. It can be as simple as, 10 balls, station one, maybe it's they're working on center face contact, maybe they're working on grip, maybe they're working on takeaway, whatever it is, but 10 balls. They walk to the bucket, they get 10 balls, and then they do drill two. So maybe drill two is something to do with wrist or whatever it is, but there's two separate drills. Let's say drill one is a grip drill, drill two is a center face contact drill. drill. So they'll do 10 balls of grip, go to the bucket, get 10 balls, 10 balls of center face contact, go back to the bucket, 10 balls of grip. And then when you come back to the grip, you've not focused on, you're like, okay, I've got to remember what I did 10 balls ago. And that is how we learn. So here there's spacing, there's variability and there's optimal challenge, but there's optimal challenge for that individual for that person. Now, we can go all the way to the other end and this would be a, an elite college player or a tour player that I work with. And it's gonna look something like this. So station one, they're gonna do two balls of the sandwich drill. Uh, and this is one of my favorite drills, so I'll try and demonstrate this. So sandwich drill, you basically sandwich the movement that you're trying to get away from in your swing in between the desired move. So I tend to roll the club like this. So I would go, good swing, 
just a practice swing. Bad swing. Good swing. And then I would hit one shot. So that's the sandwich drill. Three practice swings. Good, bad, good. Then hit one ball. And on this diagram, I do that twice. So I do two sandwich. So I've done good, bad, good, hit shot. Good, bad, good, hit shot. Fully engaged, full movements, slow speeds, never breaking it up and segmenting it. Always nice and flowing and always engaged in the full context of the shot. Then I have to go hole three, six, nine foot put in a row before I'm allowed onto station two. So I go, I go three foot, I miss, I go six, uh, so then I'll start again. I go three foot, I make, six foot, I make, nine foot, I make, great, I can go to station two. So I go to station two and KMI stands for kinesthetic motor imagery. So basically I'm gonna stand there, I'm gonna rest my club on the floor, I'm gonna get into sort of semi-athletic posture and I'm gonna feel my way through my golf swing without moving. I'm gonna feel the sequence fire. I'm gonna visualize what the golf swing feels like in my mind, what my feet feel like, my posture. I'm gonna feel all my way through my golf swing. And when I've done that a couple of times, I'll hit shot. Uh, and then I'll do that again. I'll feel my way. So I'm having practice swings without moving. Really, really cool way to, to learn. Very, very hard. Beginners will totally struggle, but good players you work with, this can be very helpful. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to another performance station. So I have to hit, say, two wedges, a 60-yard wedge and an 80-yard wedge. Back to back, I have to hit them inside PGA Tour average. So I go and I get my wedges. And then I go to station three. And station three is five balls. First shot is at 20% speed, focusing on whatever it is I'm focusing on my golf swing. Next shot is at 40% speed then 60, then 80, then 100, and then back to the start. So that is a high level golf swing changing circuit, three stations, three specific motor learning drills, performance stations in between. What you get on the performance station depends if you're allowed to go to the next station. So huge spacing variability and challenge in there. And um, in, in response, again, to the, to the golf range question and about hitting lots of balls, if you want to learn, you should leave the range mentally tired, not physically tired. So I think critical points are we're not trying to get hold of a feeling and keep it. We're trying to lose a feeling and recall it. And we're looking at leaving the range mentally tired because our brain has been engaged, not physically tired because we've done volume. Volume does not lead to, to learning. Um, so this is a highly complex circuit, but uh, a, a good one for the appropriate person. Um, so just two examples there. Ian, and you're talking about, you know, putting uh, practice plans together for, you know, high level players. And so Scott's asking about, uh, a specific segment in terms of the, have you studied the success formula of the Asian top end female players? What are they doing differently? Uh, don't they spend inordinate amounts of time on the range? Any thought to that? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I just feel like, again, culture, right? Environment. So I did see someone on a Facebook forum before it was a few years ago. They wrote about this. Um, and they suggested that we, that in the US, we, we follow that model. Um, and, I, and, I, and I disagree because a lot of those ladies on the, uh, on the tour, the, Asia, the, 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 the lady, I think the ladies tour LPGA is mo it's more prominent than the, than the men's tour. Um, so I'll focus on that. Um, I, I think in general, they're not happy um, and I think in general, a lot of that high level engagement um, comes from not, not very pure sources of, of motivation. Like if you miss a shot, you get hit. Um, so that will keep you engaged on the golf range and that will keep you hitting balls. But, and some of them make it, 
but how many win past the age of 26, 27? How many of these women are, are happy in their lives? How many of these women are, you know, having fun and enjoying being out there? Um, I think if we take, I think it's, I can't remember the exact country, but again, I was, I asked about this myself and I was well educated by a, a few people and they said that because of the military service that boys have to do, often girls are taken under their father's wing. Um, and at the age of two, three, they're taken to the golf course and it's like super serious straight away. Um, and if you're not focused and if you're not hitting this many balls, then there's some form of physical punishment. Um, and then you've got to achieve X or you've got to achieve Y to avoid this kind of verbal abuse. Like it, it, it's a little crazy for me. So um, I, I, I might have butchered that a bit because I'm not as well read in that as I am in other things. But honestly, if we look at that model, um, it's what do you want? Do you want people to be happy, healthy, functional, having fun, play until they're 45, 50 years old, like Phil? Or do you want people burning out at 26 and hating the sport, but you know, you had seven of the top 10 in the world at this point? It's a it's a it's a tough one to ask, but I, I think that it works uh, because of the level of engagement. Like I said about Tiger and the Williams sisters, I think that environment, because of the consequence, creates such a high level of, of engagement. And when, you know, most kids practice in the US, there's no consequence. They can just drop a ball and they can just repeat the shot. So there's not that much engagement there. But that consequence of being hit or, or having this torture put your way verbal, physical, that's a consequence I, I, I don't think we should be moving towards. Cool, you can keep going, man. Okay, perfect. So um, the first two we were looking at, realistically, the golf range and changing a golf swing. How do we learn to change a golf swing? And how do we manipulate spacing vari variability and challenge regarding the golf swing? Now we're shifting gears a little bit Let's look at it regarding performance. So how do we, sorry. Can you guys still see my? Um, yeah, we still got your screen. Presentation. Not the presentation though. You're just on your desktop now. Uh, sorry, it's jumped off from me. I'll, I'll open it up again. Okay, there we go. We got there in the end. Um, so this one is, a, is an example now. We're shifting gears into more performance. So let's say mechanics aren't necessarily the primary goal anymore. We're coming more closer to a tournament. This person's got to be ready to play. Often the thinking is, right, let's, let's play some games. And we play the games in isolation. Let's play a chipping game. Then let's play a putting game. Then let's play an iron game. And for good players or decent players, even some club golfers, there's not enough spacing in the basic playing of an isolated game. There's not enough variability and there's not enough challenge. And what I mean by that is if we're playing a traditional chipping game, this student's gonna hit a chip shot. Then he's gonna move around to the left. We can see that second ball um, somewhere over here. He's gonna have readily available information from hitting this chip shot to help him hit this chip shot. 
And that's going to impact his process. He might not go through his full routine. He might not walk out the shot. He might not quite treat it like a shot on the golf course. Then when he hits his next one from over there, same again. He's got readily available information from these two. And then let's say he even walks in the opposite direction and puts it on a bare lie. He still knows the grain. He still knows the grass. He still has a feel for the dew, for the wind. There's information, and all of us have this in our supercomputer. Our brain is a supercomputer. There's information in there that he wouldn't have on the golf course. That's why when people play these games, they can score higher than they can score on the golf course because the space in between each shot and the variability of task is far higher on the, on the golf course. So one thing that we can do is we can interleave games. So we can see here, there's a shot from game one that was a landing zone challenge game. Now he's moved to game two, which is nine shots, shot shaping. And he's going to hit this shot from game two. So he's hit shot one, game one. Now he's hitting shot one, game two. And then you've guessed it. Shot three, sorry, game three, shot one. This is a different style chipping game. This is proximity now, not landing zone. This is proximity. This student struggled to couple flight and landing. So that's why he's got two chipping games. Strength of his game was his iron shots. So we put that one in the middle. 27 points available, nine shots in each game. Target score 17. And the consequence is no track man if he doesn't get 17. So, you know, I spoke a little bit about maybe the, the, the way the consequence for the Asian um, players is sometimes too high. This consequence is still there. It's obviously not um, as, as fearful or as high as that, but we're putting something on the line. Um, so there, he, he did really well in this challenge, actually. Um, and, you know, the feedback is always they enjoy it. It's fun. It's like golf. So I think what we're not doing with spacing variability and challenge or, or game-like training is we're not playing games. We're designing specific tasks that will address the needs of our player. And we're trying to do it in an environment that recreates and simulates situations they'll face on the golf course. So in general, after you chip, You've probably hit an iron shot. You've probably walked a certain distance, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the kids at core, they made the rule, not me. Uh, it shows that maybe they listen to me. They carry their golf bags now. When we play games like this, they'll put their golf bags on their back. They'll move around with their golf bags. They, they joke with me about these concepts sometimes, um, but you can see a lot of them are, are buying into it. And if you came to watch one of our practices, it's organized chaos would be the best way that, that I would frame it. Um, this is hey, another, uh, yes. Uh, real quick, just uh, two things. I, we'll probably go till maybe five or 10 after just because we start a little bit late. Yep. So I just want to give you sort of a heads up of where we're at. And also we have a question uh, from Leanne. Um, positive versus negative consequences. Does one work better than the other? Positive versus negative consequences. Yeah, so, I mean, the best consequence that, that I have on, an, on the negative side is if we're going to play a game for 60 minutes and they miss a shot or they miss a string of shots or they fail to achieve something, I give them time penalties. So they have to stand still for two minutes. They're not allowed to look at their phone. And then that's a chance for them to get points sort of like evaporating away. Or we might say, if you're in, if you're in that game, and let's say you didn't chip it inside 10 feet, then you have to go and hold a six foot putt before you're allowed back into the game. So as you're missing those putts or as you're walking over there, time is ticking off the clock. I've found that to be the best. Um, a lot of the kids that I work with, they come from very affluent backgrounds. They literally have everything that, that they need. I don't really know how I can with the positive stuff, sometimes we've gone in like maybe let a kid design a golf bag or, but th th there's not the, there's not the care for the, 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 the rewards 
as there is for the opportunity of getting less points. Just, just what I've, just what I've noticed. There's no science in that. That's just my own uh, observation. Um, so that, that's just how I manipulate that. Cool. Uh, shall I carry on, Mark? Yeah, go for it. Okay, so very quickly, this one is super simple. This is like this is what we would call a serial game, where we predetermine the order of the shots. So, driver onto a 45-yard fairway, nine iron inside, ten feet, hole a three-foot putt. If you do all three in a row. You complete this grid, you move on to the next grid. Driver into a 40-yard fairway, pitching wedge inside 10 feet, hole a six-foot putt. Obviously, this is designed for a tour player who wants to work on scoring. Um, if you are coaching a average golfer, you can make the fairway 60 yards wide, and you could make it 50 feet, 40 feet. You could make it get the ball in the air going down in this direction. But what you should make it is you only get one chance, just like on the golf course, and then you only get one chance. And all three in a row must be completed to get off the grid. And then you go to the next grid. And you've got one hour to try and complete all four grids. Um, and I will have some juniors that aren't that great playing it with different numbers against juniors that are very good. Every time the juniors that are very good fail, they have to get the ball up and down from a short-sided position to be allowed back in the game. Whereas when the average junior fails, they can just continue, go back to the same grid, start again. So just manipulating the challenge point that way. So someone, two different ability players can play against each other just by manipulating the rules a little bit. Um, finally, the golf course. This is the last slide pretty much, and then we'll be done. So how do we coach skill transfer, especially with topics that uh, players don't often want to engage in, course strategy, mental routine, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we try and make it a game. So I'm just going to play this one for you guys. This one is all designed around strategy. On-course challenge, the eliminator. During this on-course task, a player will choose the side of the hole they want to eliminate for the tee shot. In this instance, the player has chosen to eliminate the left side. Any ball that lands to the left of the fairway will be given a two-stroke penalty. The player will then play an approach shot, selecting which side of the flag they want to eliminate. In this instance, the player has chosen to eliminate the right side of the flag. Any ball that lands to the right side of the flag will be given a two-stroke penalty. Once the approach shot has been hit, the player should continue to play as normal from around the green, attempting to shoot the lowest score that they can. So that's a, that's a cool way. Uh, that, that's called constraints-led learning. Um, so I guess we've moved away a little bit from spacing variability and challenge there. And what we're doing is we're creating games on the golf course that force certain behaviors to emerge. So my students tend not to think very strategically. So I put those rules in place. Sometimes I make it, if you hit it to the side, you've eliminated, you have to bring it 50 yards back. Or on the approach shot, if you hit it to the side of the flag that you eliminated, automatic plug bunker shot. If you're on the correct side, auto eight foot for birdie. And with those rewards, um, you see the kids' behaviors change. Oh, I just have to hit it onto the left side of the green away from this tuck pin and then I get eight foot for birdie. And then they aim there and then they push it and they're like, oh, I've nearly got eight foot for birdie anyway. And it's not the words leaving my mouth that are influencing behaviors. It goes back to that environment. Ask not what's in your head, but what your head is in. Creating an environment that has spacing, variability, challenge, context, and will allow skill retention and skill transfer the maximum chance of, of happening. Um, so that's it uh, for everyone. Mar um, Game like training is where I post a lot of my coaching. Um, I have a YouTube. Uh, I think I have 
like I'll skip through this real quick, Mark. If everyone, all of these are like examples of my online courses and, and things that I have to offer. But if everyone gets their phone and holds it over this QR code, uh, basically it will take you to my, um, to my link tree. And if you go to my link tree, there'll be a lot of uh, free downloads and things like that. And I'm also happy to put an email together uh, for everyone this, uh, that, that, that shares anything that, that I've done that you can grab for free. Um, but that's it from, from me, Mark. That's, that's everything. I'd love to hang out and answer questions. Yeah, I mean, I would encourage everyone to please uh, get uh, the book and, and check out uh, also uh, Golf Outs, which is uh, all the sort of yeah. the range games and things. I used that. Uh, Ian was nice enough to pass that along to me last year when we were doing some stuff during COVID or year before. I don't know, it's all a blur, but uh, and a lot of my students are still using it at the range uh, and finding some really great value in it. Um, and the book is super, Golf Practices 1795 right here. I got it on Amazon. Um, two quick ones before we um, uh, summarize our upcoming schedule here and let everybody go. And, I, I, and just a couple quick ones on this. So we are a, a vast majority of us are dealing with uh, the everyday golfer with limited time constraints. I, yeah. I think you've pretty much sort of told us right straight away here what in general, th the way they need to be practicing, but if they can only get into the range and it is probably the range for a lot of them uh, once a week, any thoughts about maximizing their time as much as possible? Yeah, I, I honestly, less balls, more engagement. And it just being specific. So the everyday golfer, um, are they training to learn? Do they really need that mechanical change? Um, if they do, then I would probably go more towards like those initial circuits that I showed with the sandwich drill, the speed variability testing, the, the motor imagery and five balls, change to a different drill, five balls, change to a different drill. And then if, if the competition's coming up, the club medal, or they want to get their handicap down, the, the four ball partner, member guest, whatever, probably some of those ones where it goes driver, iron, pitch, driver, iron, pitch, and write it down, have a scorecard. And I think the coach's role can be really to fire them up and really value like, hey, if you hit big slash driver, don't put another driver down and hit, hit it again and look to fix. Because before you know it, you'll be machine gunning golf balls. Just if they go for an hour, maybe it could be 25 minutes of those drills that I initially showed that we just talked about. Five minute journal on what they learned about their swing. And then 25 minutes of a game um, that's a serial game. And they just have to stick to that, post a score. And every time they go, they try and beat their score. I think that'd be a real nice way. I, I'm working with a guy in Spain. He's a priest. He plays off nine. He wants to get down to five. And he's probably one of the most motivated um, guys that I work with. And that's kind of what we do. He's got limited time, but that's what we do with him. And then when he goes on the golf course, he has a mental game scorecard as well as his normal scorecard. And, and he sends me that and then, we just get him training his pre-shot routine in, in those games on the range. That's great, man. Um, while I'm asking this last one, do me a favor. Can you unshare your screen? Because, Christine, I might want to share my screen real quick just to go over the events coming up. Uh, Ian, real quick, because this is a big part of a lot of, of what we do, especially up here in the wintertime. And now you're up there in the cold now, too. So indoor practice uh, on launch monitors and stuff. Um, yeah. just your thoughts on those. I mean, they're obviously getting better with being able to play games and things like that, but what's your take there? Yeah. So I love the person that asked about the physical side of things. I think that can be huge in indoor practice. So it would be like five, five balls of sandwich drill, five minutes of body conditioning, whatever your TPI exercises are. And then maybe five minutes on the track man or one hole on the track man playing and then back round. And you see our kids, they're just always looping round. Um, that's the way we do it. We do, 
the, the danger with indoor is you get too internally focused. There's a lot of research about external focus and connecting the movements to the shot shapes. So one thing that we did, we took photos of ourselves and we printed our faces off and they put them into the nets that they hit into. And like, so they'll, they'll have three coaches. If I'm on the top left and it's a right-hander, I'm high, high, uh, high fade. If they are coach on the top right, they're push draw. And you're trying to hit the coach's head and the kids just think it's awesome. And then like golf balls going through our eyes and noses. But we, we, we're getting some form of external focus in there as well. So I think it's very important. They work on mechanics deliberately. Sandwich drill, speed variability, five minutes. Physical exercises, five minutes. Something with external focus. The example I just gave, talking your pre-shot routine out loud, practicing breathing and hitting shots to targets, and then back around to the mechanics. Just always moving, always changing. Uh, that would be the way that I would do it. Very, I'm, not, I'm definitely not anti-block practice, but my blocks are blocks of fire. <laughs> and then you change to another block, and then you change to another block. I think that's a great way to sort of frame it. Gotcha. Gotcha, man. All right, so I think... Uh... That's awesome, dude. I really appreciate it. Is everybody, Christine, you see my screen here? Okay. So uh, before we let Ian go, we just want to remind everybody, uh, here's the upcoming schedule. So here we are today uh, with some great stuff with Ian. Please uh, give him a look, um, purchase his stuff because it's been very helpful. Um, next week, we'll be doing a, a, a session uh, on personal wellness. Uh, we've been talking about this one a lot, and I hope that all of you will, will join us for this. We uh, really appreciate it. Also want to uh, thank Greg Stark from Golf Genius. Uh, they've partnered up with us. We've added a couple here on the 15th and 22nd for those of you who use their, their stuff. Uh, this is going to be great uh, for improving your ability to use their software tournaments and Golf Shop POS system. So uh, they've been a, a great ad as a partner in our section. So we really encourage you to, to join Greg for these, especially if you're um, uh, engaged with them and using Golf Genius. Uh, and on sandwiched in between there, no pun intended, Ian, sorry, sandwiching, <laughs> uh, 21st, uh, uh, creating a solid financial foundation. We're going to talk uh, about something that maybe a lot of us aren't particularly good at, and that is financial planning. Uh, just sort of a 30,000 foot view for life insurance and financial planning. Um, Brian Digg is, is awesome. He'll be entertaining. He'll be fun. And he'll, uh, he'll keep everybody engaged. And that leads us up to our big one coming up for our section. This is in person uh, at Lansdowne as a part of the super meeting, the uh, teaching summit chaired by John Scott Rattan, uh, 28th and 1st. Uh, you can go online and see all the guests. I won't bore you with all that, but I can promise you that John Scott has an awesome lineup set up. Uh, so definitely something you don't want to miss. So you can sign up on our, on our website. Uh, for all that stuff. And if you have any questions, uh, Christine or myself or Sean English, uh, we'll help you. So uh, Ian, thanks so much, man. Uh, we really appreciate you joining us. Everybody, please look him up. Uh, have a safe rest of the week. And uh, we look forward to seeing all of you next Monday at one o'clock Eastern on here as well. All right. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, guys. Thanks, thanks Ian. everyone. Thanks, Ian. Thank, Thank you. Buddy.